things in that some of them, some of the figures appear very strange and uh, but convincing. Um, and that, you know, Rosemary, I think in these works, the figures, um, they, they retain, they retain something that, I mean, Cezanne, I think, kind of blew it apart even more. I mean, I see, I, I see it in some of the, um, the, the studies in Rosemary's work. They become very, um, the figure starts to become um, very abstracted. And, uh, and I guess that's sort of what I'm thinking of, Martha, about um, the notion of abstraction in this work. I mean, it's said that she always felt her, herself as an abstract well, painter. All painting is abstract, and she certainly <laughs> believed that and approached it that way. So there was you know, a difference in terms of making a complete whole, whether it represents something or whether it represents nothing. That's uh, a pretty accepted idea. What, one of the things I find really striking about these is the use of greens in the figure, in the skin tones. I think um, uh, it's, it's kind of like in the, in the Italian primitives, but it's stronger and, and more uh, intense in color. And I think that's uh, really very unusual because you, you don't see that kind of color in a, in a figure painting that reads as real. You see it in a painting that reads as expressionist. Uh, and here you have it, and it doesn't read as an expressionist painting. It reads as, they read as real. But, but take a look at the greens. They're really pretty fantastic. Mm -hmm. There's incredible variety. And I think, Catherine, isn't green, green is a color that sometimes painters shy oh, away from. Oh, people hate green painting. I just gave up. Mm -hmm. Just didn't use it at all. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, I, I guess, the, I mean, you were talking about the drawing, which I, I find so beautiful. The color, to me, is also quite uncanny mm -hmm. in some way. Uh, I mean, she gets away with so much, but it's not getting away with it. It's making, making it, work. Yeah. making, using it to make meaning. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm, I'm wondering, um, at this point, if we could open it up um, to some questions, unless anyone has I'll tell one story. story. Yeah, please. I'll tell one story. story. <laughs> but I know that there are many people in this audience who have some oh, really good stories as well. But I'm, there is one I am very eager to tell. Uh, 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 well, I first studied with her mm -hmm. in undergraduate school, and uh, I got to know her. I studied then went to study with her in graduate school, and then I got to know her. When I was living in New York, we would meet for breakfast at 6.30 in the morning, which was not easy for me when I was 30 or 25 or whatever age I was. <laughs> that was not, that was a challenge. Uh, and I, you know, I continued. I, there was her work, which is so, I think uncanny is the word that I keep coming up with because I just, I just don't know how she can do such, you know, I guess it's, it may be clear it's not closed, uh, and, and that sort of mystery and sense of longing is so powerful to me. And I particularly am um, so taken with this period, though the embroiders everything was amazing, but I went uh, one time. Uh, oh, and typical of her, I remember when I was in my studio in graduate school, and she said, oh, you know, you know, this work of yours, you should be reading the Marquis de Sade. And that was just like a typical thing for her to say. It's like, yeah, why not? Because I think that for me, and I, I, I think it was for all of her students, I imagine this, that the giving of permissions, the encouragement of becoming authentically yourself, and to be not afraid, was very, very important. That was a very important message that I got from her. So one day, when I was, had moved to Delaware, uh, I was working on a painting, and I'd been working on it for quite a while, and it was really terrible. And <laughs> it was, well, it was boring and uh, flat, and uh, let's see, the color nowhere. Uh, 
Uh, it just was, it was stupid. It was a stupid, stupid painting. <laughs> and I kept working on it, and it just stayed stupid. And so finally, I called her up. And this is before, this is a long time ago, so no cell phones, no pictures, no nothing. But I called her up, and I said, my painting, it's, so, it's awful. <laughs> And I probably was calling her because I was procrastinating or, you know, desperate or, or I knew she would give me some kind of strength or some kind of new way of coping that I got s s sort of got too narrow-minded to imagine. And she, you know what she said? It's, I've never gotten over this. Uh, it, by the way, it was a painting, an interior with a with some furniture, old furniture, and it, there was a window, and you could see out the window, and so there were things outside. It was working, working. And she said, um, she just said, check the intervals. Mm -hmm. Check the intervals. <laughs> the only thing she said. So I was, I got off the phone, and I got my sighting stick, and I, and she was right. <laughs> and I re reorganized re the whole thing. And what <laughs> happened, I just don't get how she could do this, is that the, uh, the space and the air opened up and back, and the space became more palpable and powerful, and the feeling, the feeling swelled up and became longing. <laughs> What are intervals? Could you tell me? The, the, I, I, I made everything the same size, and it was oh. boring. And that's one reason uh -huh. it was boring. Yeah, I get it. Uh, I was not. I, it, it was, uh, I wasn't seeing how sort of. Dilute. I wasn't somehow grappling with the. Well, I keep using the word mysterious, but the but whatever was elusive, I wasn't getting. And I wasn't getting anything else either, <laughs> but but somehow she understood, and you know that really impressed me that she could do a critique that worked over the telephone. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> and the other thing I wanted to share is that at the end of her life, um, uh, I remember I spent a lot of time in New York, or any time I could, I came to New York just to be around because. This was a, she, she kept giving to everyone. And uh, so she taught me how to embroider. And, uh, and I, uh, I would also be painting there, just in the corner of her room. And she would be drawing when she was still able to do that. And it was just, this incredible privilege to be around her at that time. And you, you neglected to say that it was four flights of stairs mm -hmm. that you had to bring that painting up. And everybody was bringing their paintings up <laughs> to get a critique from her when she, when she wasn't able to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. And I remember people holding their paintings up because she sometimes she couldn't lift her head. And they'd be holding the painting up so she could see it and mm. and give and because she would give that I, I so agree the giving is never seen so much given and somebody yes it's, yes it's amazing those few like, uh, and and she she I think that she felt many many things at this time and I think she shared various elements of her reflections, or what she was struggling with, with the people who were best at talking with her about whatever was appropriate for them. But what she gave a number of us, and I don't think this was true for everyone because she was, there were some, she was so complex, is she made, she made me understand that you didn't have to be afraid in life, that you didn't have to be afraid. And I think that there were times when she was, you know, that we all struggled, but she, she kept giving all of us these, these gifts, which you now really can transform your life. And, mm -hmm. and of course, the, and the paintings and the life for me were very much a seamless 
continuity of strength and energy and, and that humor and complexity. It's still coming through and it's here in the paintings. Um, I, thank you guys. It was really so wonderful <laughs> to hear from you. And uh, I want to open it up to um, to the floor and if anyone has questions or would like to address uh, the work specifically or um, It's a very beautiful evening, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And the pictures look wonderful. Yeah. I'm glad you s talked about Cezanne. She's so deep with Cezanne. I mean, everyone talks about Cezanne, but who makes figures like Cezanne? <laughs> Some of the French people did, Gomer, who she liked. And, but in America, there are very few that we know. But there used to be more, I think. In the 20s, there were hmm. more. That's a marvelous Eric. picture. Talk about Cezanne. Look oh at that gosh. sheet. Yes. Look at that so sheet beautiful. there. Mm -hmm. Look at how it's painted. Yeah, look at that sheet in the bed. Look at that. Look at that. That blanket. Uh, look at the grandeur of it. It's the Mont Yes. <laughs> you know, Eric, Eric the, uh, here at the National Arts Club, and I, and I can't, can't help but bring this up. Um, I'm a member here. I've been a long time, and my family remembers here in this club. And there's a great tradition in this place uh, of painting uh, that goes back a long way of good painting, and some of it not so good. But to have these paintings here um, by such a great woman artist is really unbelievably amazing. Mm -hmm. And for me to, to be able to see them here and for everybody to experience them here in our community uh, of artists of, like Paul and other people, the real good painters from, from the 60s and the 50s who painted figuratively, and um, she's right up there. I was very lucky to actually meet Isabel Bishop here in this room, like 19, I don't know, what's 76 or 77, something like that. And I think of her in that context, you know, of the, of the really, the very best women artists. There's a Peggy Bacon painting up in the gallery upstairs, but the women painters who are so, so important in our history, American art history, and she's one of them. And I just couldn't help but want to put this in that context and to, to be able to see this here at this place. So thank you all for making this happen. Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to say, I just, I'd like to hear more stories. Yeah. And I know there are a lot of people. I would be thrilled. Um, well, there's a lot, but um, she, uh, you know, in the drawing class, I, I think uh, oh, every time I would come out laughing, uh, my, my stomach would hurt from laughing. It was so <laughs> incredibly funny. Um, and, you know, things, things like uh, she would grab somebody and say, well, it's the greatest drawing, it's amazing. I wouldn't send it to the myth quite yet, but um, <laughs> stuff like that. And, um, and it was, jeez. There was one time, I, you know, I won't mention the name, but somebody came and, and gave a lecture in the New York Studio School and showed their work, showed their work. Um, and they showed a video of, of, sculpt, of themselves sculpting. And I was sitting next to Rosemary, and uh, she just started shouting. Uh, and, and he was showing himself blow blowtorching his, his sculpture. And she started shouting, and, and she, you know, everybody's like quiet, and it's a lecture, and she's like, I'll have a wing. Fry that chicken. <laughs> <laughs> the whole time. It was like incredible. And it was so appropriate because he, he, she wanted, it, it, it wasn't, uh, it was, because she loved the person. She loved his art. She loved him. But it was about the ego. She didn't like ego, you know, and, and, and uh, that, that was, you know. <laughs> I think as a, as a student, she made you just a, a much better draftsman. And, and I think because she didn't want you to do something that's how it looks. I think, 
and she wanted you to try and, and find um, something deeper, real, more, you know, like she would say, don't draw the expression, of, don't draw the features of the face, but draw the tilt of the neck. You know, draw, the, you know, look for um, the movement or, and, and, and continuously, everything she would say was like about the, the ego and, and what's that external versus what, what you, what's deep, you know, what's real. What's actually more meaningful? No. Yeah. Would anybody else like to uh, have a question? Comment? I could tell you how these were done. Uh, yeah. We used Please. to draw. Uh, we used to draw every once a week. Couple of years, and we had these two kids who were in love with each other, and they posed for us uh, as lovers. I mean, nothing at all uh, 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 coarse about it or, or dirty about it. <laughs> But I never saw these pictures, which came from me. No. Where have they been? I don't know where these pictures have been. I don't know. <laughs> and how she painted in that small place. Too. Are these authentic, Paul? What? Are these authentic? How do you mean? Are these the real thing? Were mean? these made by somebody else? I'm joking. <laughs> That's a bad joke. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no consequence. Right. And she had those drawings, and um, Doris uh, found them. and. Um, she sent them to you, to you, Paul, and you yeah, yeah. arranged the, the show of the yeah, drawing. Yeah, show together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. show of the drawing on, on Valentine's Day, about 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Over how long of a period did you have the pair of models? Well, I can't believe that they would have been in love for two years, but maybe it's only one year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 They were beautiful, but they didn't look anything like these kids yeah, in these pictures. No, they didn't look like this. No. no. She changed them a great deal. Yeah. This isn't them. Well, it came from them, from the poses. Yeah. yeah. We had these poses. Yeah. So, do, do you have similar paintings? Do you have similar paintings of these poses? No, I. Yeah, I have some, yeah. No, I didn't put them in this way. I put them in the landscape. Yeah. It'd be interesting but I've actually seen Paul's drawings on the internet. So if you just want to see them, you can find no, them. No, about paintings, though. I don't, I know, I never went, made big paintings like this. I never went this far into the Cezanne mode mm -hmm. of paintings. I'm very impressed with these. How did you meet Rosemary? Oh, at the Perido Gallery. Because I showed there. And uh, that's where she had to, She had been there before me. Yeah. And her, I ran by a wonderful man named Lou Pollock, who was uh, also transitioning between abstract painting and figure painting himself without knowing it. Uh -huh. So we all part of that, yes. Did you, did you uh, when you made that transition, when you started drawing the figure and painting the figure, well, um, no, we did, I didn't. I said the dealer was making a transition. Oh, okay, the dealer. He was making it. So he was dealing. He had had shows with Gustin, and uh, you know, he had shows like that. And Gustin was abstract, of course. Uh, and then he began to show, he began to show me, and Rosemary was changing, and Remenick, a great landscape painter. Yeah. Yep. yeah, Paul, you had a show of small landscapes, right? 75, there, Ferrydale, small 
No, small landscapes there. No, that was somewhere else. Right. Yeah. So I mean, we can, and we live near each other, I should say. That's very important. But mm. we lived about a few blocks. I lived in Washington Square North, and she lived on 12th Street. Mm. So we saw each other all the time. That's part of it. The world is small. Everyone lived downtown. Mm -hmm. Very important, that fact. We saw everybody all the time. Well, the art world was very, it was much smaller then, yeah. too, that yeah. it was easier to know everyone. Yeah. Well, at yeah. that time, there was, she had two, they had two apartments. They had the one down mm -hmm. below for yeah. a studio, and then, or was it the other way around? But anyway, they had, it was not as crowded as it became later. Right. No, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and her husband was so brilliant. Mm -hmm. He knew nothing yeah. about pictures. <laughs> <laughs> but he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Made a great martini. <laughs> <laughs> and wasn't he Colette's American editor? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important somehow with this work because when I when I look at this work and I look at what is so amazing so amazing to me about this work and about all of her work. Somehow, in my mind, it relates to the openness of Colette, because she also was strong enough to be unguarded. Maybe that's what it, it was, that there wasn't that trying to contain things nicely. Mm -hmm. I find it curious that she moved from abstract to more figurative. Mm -hmm. But you and carry things with you. You don't leave something behind. Yes. It, it keeps growing and changing. It's, it's never left behind. How is this not in many ways abstract? Yeah, absolutely. It wasn't left behind so much morphed. No, it, there was no great another. division. Yeah. And you'll see that if you come to see the show that uh, Stephen Harvey is going to have. There'll be, some, there'll be three large paintings there that come before these. And you'll see the interweave of, of the figure with the the more non-objective. It's as if they just come out right out of the the of the shapes, uh, much more even than these do. These are more solid than you love to see them. Is that on the Is that no? It's going to be. It's going to open the the thirtieth of May. Where? Where is it? On Forsyth Street, which is near Second Avenue and Austin. But they did think when you when you when you. Really <laughs> <laughs> no one knows where Forsyth Street is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elliot. Do they all know where Forsyth Street is? Okay. <laughs> what did they do? more exciting when it's both. Yeah, maybe that's what she's and trying that, to say. Yeah. That drew her. Yeah. And like, you know, sitting here for an hour looking at these paintings like this, I can't, everywhere I look there's this sort of yeah. somewhere. Every, every, like I'm almost seeing the mark more than I am the figures. Really and um, it's weird because, like, I, I was I, I uh, did drawing with her in the afternoons at the studio school when I first got there. And my memory of her as a teacher is different than Doobie's. Like, I was just thinking, I remember her hand. And she, and I, when I first met her, I, she, she reminded me, her hand reminded me of this, um, this lady who was a farmer in Australia who was, that I knew who was like a, an old lady, but she had this great big hand, she was like a battle axe. <laughs> And there's something about Rosemary that was like this, you know, big, strong survivor of of the uh, 
you know, the art world or something. <laughs> And uh, but she she would walk around the class, just keep going around and around and around and around. She kept saying about the drawing, go keep going around and around and around around. But she actually physically did it in the class. And she, you know, you think she'd be over there and you'd be drawing something, she'd be behind you with her <laughs> hand. And so I, I, you know, I feel that I, the, the mark making that keeps going around and around and around. And like when I first walked in, I saw this little mark on that on that light shade there on that painting, on this really just sensitive little mark that I hadn't noticed them before in the paintings. Like, there's something about the way they're hung in this room that I can see it, I see them very differently. And, and the first time I met her was when I, I, and I can't remember the year, probably someone will know the date when she moved studios. And it was like 98 or something, or not, early 99, or, I can't remember when it was, but I got this job to help her move her studio, so I didn't even know who this lady was. And we spent the whole day moving all these paintings. It was really hot, and moving, you know, doing all this physical work. And she just stood there for the whole day, and was silent. But she got tired and tired and tired as the day. We were doing all the work, and she just stood there. But she got physically—you could see she was getting getting tired all day. And at the end of the day, like like. We were talking, and she said, "It's really hard work looking at a life's work." Just we were going, going, going past her, and she just stood there looking at him, and physically got tired. And so, I sort of wish she could see him here because they look really good here, and maybe she'd feel differently about about that. But, When it was Rosemary, <laughs> well, we went to the museum almost every day in Athens. Um, we went to the American Embassy. There was an architect who had designed it, and I guess he had a lady to that. And she was horrified that she'd have to go through guards because she felt she was an American citizen. And the guard said she had to go through this screening. And when she did, she kept blowing the whistle. <laughs> and the thing kept screeching, and we couldn't find anything on her body that was causing that. And we just assumed eventually that something had gotten lost in the hem. And that tamed Becky for the rest of the day. <laughs> It was a wonderful trip, and she enjoyed it very much. I remember how much she loved the uh, the Greek face paintings. Yes. And, and the the just that the power of the figures and the drawing in the, in the work. Tell about how you how that trip was financed. This is an interesting story, I think. Well, she had given her um, a, a small. I think, what was it? It wasn't a row. No, no, it wasn't was it Augusta, wasn't it? Augusta? I thought it was a new no, no, it wasn't Augusta. It was an etchy. I thought it was a new row, wasn't it? I think you're right. I think <laughs> you're right. <laughs> and anyway, it was small. It was coffee stained. And uh, it, it was just very small. But it had a, a lot of provenance because she, people had bought it and given it to somebody else. And then somebody else, and they all signed it. And uh, I decided that I needed to sell it. And it had a coffee stain, so I had it uh, restored. And I was told that some of these it would go for $3,000. And it went for $14,000. And so I went to Becky and I said, Becky, half of this is yours. And she said, I will not take it. And I said, well, if you don't take it, I'm going to have every appliance you can think of brought to your place because I'm going to spend it on you anyway. <laughs> so we decided to go to Greece. <laughs> were, you, did, were you drawing from at the museum? Were, well, she did. She, she did, did a lot of drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't let me take a photograph of it during the entire trip. Of course I did. 
No, it was just it was just the media. Uh, later on, uh, she said, "Well, uh, why didn't we take some pictures?" And I said, "Because she didn't." Let <laughs> I I remember how beautiful she was, and I remember her telling me one time that she was went on a trip to Europe alone, and I think she squeaked together some kind of money to go to La Scala, and she said she had the worst tickets that anyone could possibly have. So she was up, up, up at the back of the, how many, I don't know how many balconies there are because I've never been there, behind a pillar. <laughs> and she said she heard this whispering going through the audience, Callas, 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 because of course she looked just like Maria Callas. And they thought that Maria Callas was at La Scala, <laughs> up in the back behind the Callas. <laughs> I remember that very years. well. Yes, and I remember her painting, and she would never show the painting while she was working on it. And what, before uh, I would get up from the chair, she would reverse it so that the back was to me, so that I couldn't see what she was doing. But it was many times a kind of an agony for her. It wasn't going the way she wanted. And she would use a cloth always to kind of wipe it. But we would talk about everything. That was during the uh, that big trial where the man who supposedly killed his wife. OJ Simpson. Uh, OJ Simpson. Uh, <laughs> and you could always turn to the wall. And she would do that and you could never see them. Yeah, right. right. And after she died, I turned them all around. She did that in the studio too? Yes. Mm -hmm. she, she put the canvas so that you couldn't see it, and, right. and she'd take it down and put it against the wall. Right. Until it was finished? Or always. They were all, they were all with their face to the wall. It was, so I never saw them, you know, and I was very honored when she was going to have this show at Queen's. She asked me to help her pick the paintings, and I'd like, I hadn't seen them. And they were always backwards, and of course I didn't touch them. I could have got it peaked, I guess, but I didn't. And she would she would compose as we as she was doing paintings yes. with me. She would get a piece of material and make a, a pink kind of dress for Phaedra. Uh, then she would have me sit in a chair, and I was the nursemaid, uh, and so she. We put all these pieces together, you see. She called herself a composer. That's what she said to me when she was, on the Valentine's Day, when she was diagnosed. She said, tell everyone, foremost, I am a composer. <laughs> she made um, little clay figures. She, oh, yes. She used um, uh, figures that she'd buy in flea markets. She, she made... Uh, the, the figures would be very small, but she would use them to kind of figure out how the light would come and so forth. So she did all sorts of things with uh, plaster of Paris stuff to yes. try to set up compositions so she'd have an idea. I mean, they were very, they're very rough. They're not, they don't look anything like paintings, but she would have this the three-dimensional thing to refer to. To get a sense of how light was hitting. Yeah. And and the intervals. <laughs> the intervals. She, she would do that as she was sitting for her. She would move her lamp into the uh, composition. Yeah. Or she blew the table, put in a vase somewhere, or take it away. She was always completely as she was working. I, we realized that in this painting, um, the two figures toward the back, that that the patterned fabric makes repeat appearances in a lot yeah. of work and becomes a kimono in one work, mm -hmm. uh, a tablecloth in another. So, so it's obviously a piece of, that she had. Yeah, it was something that she yeah. was constantly retextualizing, recontextualizing as new elements in, in the space, which I think is kind of wonderful. Another thing, another thing that I remember that really was amazing, um, helpful, I think, I remember one 
time we sat in front of a Rembrandt, the big, uh, the big, uh, the big one in the mid with the the head, and I think it's Solomon with the, and she was, she said the painting is in this, is in the corner, the the black corner there, not in all the figurines. I think that's a huge thing. I mean, I know it's, it's um, because it's just black, but it's, it's just as much painting as the head. So I, I, I got a lot from that, from that channel of caring about it. So. Well, she was also an excellent cook. <laughs> <laughs> she was her mother. Mm -hmm. Yes.